Lawrence Tendam, welcome to the Roadman Podcast. Okay, <laughs> nice, to, nice to see you finally. <laughs> nice to have I you, listen Lawrence. to you sometimes, and, uh, and now I finally see the face behind. Uh, actually, I googled, I, I googled some uh, some pictures of you, and then I saw you saw you racing your bike. But now I see the face behind uh, behind the mic. Yeah, it's crazy because I have some of the World Tour guys in the podcast, and like they're talking about like, oh yeah, I was listening to the podcast on the way to Trino Adriatico today and stuff. And <laughs> I was like, that's so fucking cool. Cause I never yeah. got to like, that was my dream to race those races, but I was never good enough. And for guys to be on the way to the race, listening to the Roadman podcast, it's just pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh no, I, I, I podcast myself too. And for me, it's the same. I heard so many stories of people like, uh, uh listening to the podcast or they, they they know a lot about me because i i talk a lot about my life in the podcast you know and then uh, it's almost like they are friends isn't it a crazy world where you can sit behind a computer and like i look at the stats sometimes and there's one dude if you're listening to this dude you need to reach out there's one dude in kenya and he listens to my podcast like every episode there's one download from kenya okay. And I just have this image of this guy like walking through the desert <laughs> with a spear <laughs> listening to the podcast. <laughs> Who is this? No, I don't know. Actually, actually, I don't, don't do too much that, that thing. That's more my, uh, my host. Like uh, I do it together with somebody else. But uh, I didn't even know that you could find like uh, who downloaded it. You know? Oh, yeah. You I can see the country. The you should check it out. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know that. I know we have... We're happy with the downloads we have, you know, but uh, uh, I don't know the, the exact people. Yeah, I like to t- kind of tell myself a story. So I look and I see there's some downloads in Russia. And I was like, oh, yeah, Putin's kicking it back in the Kremlin listening to the podcast. It's definitely <laughs> Putin. <laughs> wow, well, yeah. Uh, Lawrence, you have a cool motto when I was researching the podcast. And obviously, I'm a massive cycling fan and I knew who you were. So I didn't have to do that much research on it. I've been watching you for, you know, a decade plus. But some of the stuff I came across, uh, like this motto that you have, live slow, ride hard. I just thought that's so ride cool. Fast, yeah. Or yeah. live slow, ride fast, sorry. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's like my life motto, you know, and uh, it started a while ago, you know, just before. Actually, it started already in 2011. I had my first uh, live slow, ride fast camp. It was like a Twitter ride in, to, in, uh, after the classics, the week after the classics. I invited people on Twitter to come to the Ardennes and camp with me and have a campfire. And Because I also wanted to ride the roads in the Ardennes, enjoying the scenery and be with friends and be able to drink a beer and stuff like that. And I think 30 people showed up. And since then it started and uh, we took off. It feels like it's the best about cycling that that motto just kind of encapsulates it all that you can throw down hard when you're riding uphill or you're riding across wind but then once you're finished the ride you just don't take yourself too serious it's just about chilling back it's not about the fast cars and the big houses it's just like no exactly no exactly it, it is like that it's uh, also you have to enjoy the small things and uh enjoy the good coffee that's what i mean with live slow enjoy a beer once in a while a good glass of wine you know but when you drink wine drink good wine when you drink beer drink good wine when you make coffee take a t- make uh, take attention to make the right cup of coffee you know for yourself and then uh, yeah on the on the road you you just go with your friends and try to race each other and wait on top for each other and then go down and take the piss with each with each other and um, just have fun on the bike and the bike can take you everywhere and it's a it's a re- recipe for adventures you know so yeah i love to be be able to still ride my bike isn't I wrote a blog a while ago and I was reflecting back on what cycling was to me and I was looking at, at different times in my life the bike has been something completely different but at the very start it was like a way to escape the confines of my lo- local neighborhood it was a way to like broaden my world and make it a little bit bigger and when I listen to you even on some of your interviews when you're like you've made it as one of the top riders in the world you still sound like that adventurous kid who's still using it to broaden your horizon. Yeah, that's uh, exactly, that's true. That uh, Actually, my first memory I was, I was on a bike. I was on my uh, Strider bike or three wheel, I don't know, a trike. Uh, I don't know. How you say, <laughs> yeah, we got trike. 
And I was, because I was living on one of those houseboats, you know, like I'm a real Dutch guy and I was born on a houseboat and uh, I was, I just went st straight next to the channel and I, and, and I, maybe I was three years old, you know, and I was like, what the fuck, where am I, you know, and okay, <laughs> let's just return and go back to mom and dad, you know, but I started to explore there already. And uh, I remember when I was 11 years old, old I bought my, uh, my first road bike. You know, and I got rid of all the mud guards and all the all the other stuff to make it look like a real race bike. But still, every every summer I would put everything back up again, and then I would go with my dad bike packing. You know, nowadays you would call it bike packing, but yeah. back then we said uh, bike holiday or something. You know, and we would do like a lap around the Isomere of. 350 kilometers and we would take three days to do it you know and camp and make the tent and make food and stuff like that and such things were uh, the highlight of my 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 summers you know like i would still remember those three days with my dad being in the in the tiniest tent and riding our bikes around the lake you know and feel also the lift slow feeling but also the feeling of accomplishment like we did something we did something nice Now we'll be able to eat a big steak, you know, in the <laughs> at night at the campfire with my dad, you know, because we did something and now we buy a nice steak and stuff like that. So, But isn't the live slow thing just getting more and more important when you see the social media, Instagram culture that's kind of emerging where everybody's, you know, trying to put up a sort of a fake life for their best foot forward and, you True. know, relationships are quite trivial and, you know, it's we're drifting into a place where... It, it's probably the opposite of where we need to be going as a society, but live slow kind of brings it back full yeah, circle. Yeah, but I must, I must admit, you know, I have the slogan, but sometimes I also forget it, you know. Sometimes I'm also busy and going to meetings and, 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 and doing stuff maybe I don't want to do. And, uh, and then I have to realize, set back, go on the bike and go for a few hours, come back, play with the kids and enjoy that day for being good you know like go on the bike play with the kids have some attention to cooking a nice meal for yourself and the family and then the day is good already you know so then you have to yeah step back and see what what, what you really like instead of going into that red race not maybe with instagram but with companies and negotiations and we have to do uh, more and more and more and Sometimes you have to step back and think like, okay, actually what I have already is, is kind of nice and let's, uh, let's savor this, you know? Yeah, do you know what I started doing, which is a cool idea. A buddy of mine uh, who runs a big company, super busy guy, and he was saying if he didn't create time for himself, the day just gets away from him. So he started, like for my Google Calendar, obviously I have my uh, podcast recording with you in the calendar. But I also have scheduled like time for myself, what time I'm going to ride the bike at, like 9 a.m. to 12 o'clock, I'm riding the bike. So if somebody like sends me an invite and they're like, oh, well, can you do a meeting at this time or can you do a recording at this time? I look at it and I'm like, oh, you know what? I have a meeting right there that I can't move yeah. because it's like the most important meeting of the day. It's the meeting with myself and my bike to go riding. Ooh. No, you're, you're right about that. Uh, the thing is, uh, for me, it's that's that's totally natural because I, I used to be a pro cyclist and everybody would accept if I said, no, if, if they asked something for me, I would always say after 3 PM, Yeah, you know, because before I'm riding the bike and if I do the bike for three hours, I'm resting the other three hours. You yeah. know? And still, I, I like to plan all my meetings the end of the afternoon because <laughs> that's, that's still in the system of riding the bike and I still have to be competitive to race all those gravel races on foot uh, because I'm also still sponsored by some companies to do it. Uh, actually more partnerships than sponsors because we, we do a lot of other things together too, but still I want to ride the bike and, and be competitive next year in 2021. So it's also part of my routine and it's also part of who I am. So I'm, I, I do exactly the same as you do. So I definitely want to get into the gravel stuff and all about that, because I think the next chapter of your cycling is almost as exciting, if not more exciting than the previous chapters you've written. But before I jump into the gravel stuff, like what, you're 16 years as a world tour rider. And like, yeah, you, something like that. I was 16 years a pro. Yeah. Like Tour de France, top 10, Vuelta GC, top 10, you've crashes, you've ups, you've downs. 
when you started out as a kid riding your bike along the canal in Holland, yeah. what was the dream? Did you ever think you were going to get that far? Uh, actually, I didn't dare to dream it, I think. You know, once you get older, maybe. But with, when I was a young kid, I, I also, together with my parents, we went to France and watched the Tour de France. And I was so delighted to be there, you know. I, I remember the first mountain stage we did. I was 10 years old, was 91, Juplan. And I was so excited that, like, I walked up that mountain together with my parents. And my dad was pushing the, my youngest bro brother in the stroller. He was, like, two years old. And I was running with every uh, tourist guy, you know. Like, I could, I could keep <laughs> up with them, you know. I was that young, uh, young uh, kid who could keep up with the old guys climbing the mountain on their bikes. And I run, like, for kilometers like that. But... And then it started to rain and stuff like that. And that planted the seeds like, okay, you know, this is like something I, I admire those guys who did it, who did all that. And uh, somewhere I think I wanted to be it, but I never expected to be there. And that was still, I was 20, 21 years old, but, and I was racing for Rabobank, the amateur team or the U23 team, the development team. And then you start to know like, okay, I can really make it as a pro. Does it ever sink in? Because cyclists are so goal oriented that you're always looking to the next Tour de France, the next Vuelta. I want to be GC. I'm eight this year. Can I push into the top five next year? Do you ever have time during that whole process to go, you know what, just enjoy the moment because this might be as good as it gets. Like when you hit your Tour de France top 10, I'm sure yeah, you thought next year I'm going to hit top five. Stories, yeah. yeah, you actually hit a, hit a good point there because... In hindsight, I, you know, when I did that Tour de France in 2014, I, even on the Sunday night, I was already thinking about the Vuelta, who would start four weeks later. And I was also like a team leader, you know, like maybe not too much food and stuff like that. In hindsight, that was totally crazy. And also, it never got better after that Tour de France. But in that winter, after that Tour de France, I tried to be better. I was thinking, okay, I was ninth last year. Maybe I can become sixth, you know, or first five. That would be even better. So I tried to be to train more, to be a little bit more skinny, to do everything a little bit better. And I just I just emptied myself, myself too much. And the, the season 2015, so the season after was like nothing, was like... A hell of a season so uh it took me it took me time to realize that that uh, in the, uh, i went to the us in 2016 i was living in the us because in 15 i didn't like cycling anymore and there i realized like man i did so many stupid things <laughs> the winter after 2014 because i was too focused and i wanted to continue to continue and there i started to take a step back and to enjoy life and to do a little bit more live slow and there i was one whole year with a family i basically i just raced in march and in july in in the in in europe and the rest i was stayed in the us with my family so there i realized how important it is to to step back and to be with the family to be in the moment you know instead of always thinking about okay the next the next the next and i tried also to teach that to to the guys I was actually domestic for uh, since then, like Dumoulin and, and, and those other guys. So what separates a ninth in the Tour de France from a third in the Tour de France? And then as a follow-up to that, is it worth the sacrifice? You know, like to go from ninth to third, if you need to go from having a family and having a life and really being happy to living up the side of a volcano in Tenerife for six months of the year, like at what point does that trade off like, not war time. Uh, 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 yeah, that, that depends. That 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 uh, that's different with every single person. Uh, for example, uh, also nowadays, you, you're right. It's getting more and more difficult for the top guys who are doing GCs in the Grand Tours to have a normal family life. Back then, uh, back then, in the year before 2013, 2013, I didn't even do an altitude stage, <laughs> like a, like altitude camp. And I still got 13th, you know, and 14, I thought, okay, maybe put in an altitude camp for two weeks and maybe it's better. So uh, I spoke to this, for example, about it with Dumoulin and for him, it's difficult. Well, for example, with Steven Kruiswijk, I know also for my years in Jumbo Visma, he's not, he's not asking those questions you do to himself. He just does what he needs to do, what's on the schedule. He enjoys the process enough. 
And he just does it till the end of his career without asking questions like, is it worth the sacrifice or is it worth it? So, but, but Dumoulin is different and he, maybe he, I can see at him. And for example, also for me in 2015, when I was not ninth in the Tour de France, I was a lot like, what the fuck am I doing here? I broke my back the week after the Tour. I instantly decided, okay, it's enough. I go to the US now and I go to try to find the love for cycling again. Like I always started as a young kid. And I also think the young kids, they don't, like you see, I went to the tour in 91, but you don't know what's behind those guys, you know? And when a young kid now goes to the tour and he watches them climbing those mountains, he doesn't know they they are on the... On a, on a mountain for two months before, like du- Rochlis was not as uh, has not have been at home for three months in a row. Seriously? No, no, no. He hasn't been uh, at home till after the Worlds, I think. Oh, fuck, oh that's after, so after grim. Years, like, maybe. Yeah. And nobody understands this when they're watching it and they're listening to it. They just mm-hmm. think, what an amazing. They think it's like Premier League soccer. Or yeah. I'm like, you don't go home to your girlfriend every day. They think no. They think uh, you're living the dream, and it's 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 it. it like I said, it's it's different each person. Like I saw Wilco Kellerman taking the pink jersey, uh, and you saw him smile, and he there was something he dreamt uh, dreamed of, you know. He saw him also. He was also very uh, disappointed when he lost it, but uh, also I remember being with Tom in the last week of the Giro. He was in pink, and everybody tried to touch him and try once an autograph, and and Nibali was. And, 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 and Quintana was still attacking him and there was like controversy in the in the burns like they had a fight and I remember being with Tom uh, in the Village de Par and there were also some teammates and I also thought he's living the dream and I told him like okay I can see your face now and you just wish it was Monday you know like <laughs> you, would be, you would be at home and if you won or if you got second or if you got fourth it doesn't matter just let it be Monday like this needs to be over and I, you see so it's 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 lonely at the top that's what uh, the, uh, it's true. People say is stuff like that, but it's really true. And yeah, I could feel for him. Yeah. We have an Irish expression. I'm not sure if you have something similar. It's like the grass is always greener on the other side of the hill. And yeah. I, I think yeah. that's so true. I remember being in the US and I thought it was just like a continental level. And I had a buddy that I grew up, he got me into cycling. He was an old school teacher and he got me into cycling. And then I was out in the US and I was racing and he was still back home teaching his classroom. And I got a text message off him and it just said, living the dream. And I was getting yeah. a bus from Toronto to Chicago with my bike on the public transport. <laughs> it was like a 12, 13 hour bus ride to go and do like a one hour criterium. And I was sandwiched in between like these two fat people on the bus and I was reading his text and I nearly felt like crying. I was just like, this is not the dream. This is not my dream. Uh, I read the book of Phil Gaiman, like pro on $10 a day, you know, or something like that. (laughs) The the book is called, it's about the U S continental scene, you know, and uh, like, so I, I, I can see the, the situation you were in is always you try to get bigger or to, to try to get to the top. And uh, it's it's never easy. But in hindsight, you know, also the bike brought me so much fun. And also I'm, I'm totally not frustrated about having to leave now the World Tour. Or, uh, no, it's been good to me. And I'm still loving the bike right now. And I that's what I... That's what I... Uh, I, 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 I'm happy I still have that. But that's sometimes I see with colleagues, they stop and they don't touch the bike for two, three years or maybe longer. Yeah, I think I and had. I feel, uh, so, I feel I, sorry for them. I think I can't remember. One of the podcast guests, maybe it was Tyler Hamilton that I had on, and he was saying that Christian Vandevelt, when he retired, like left his bike in the bike bag for like four <laughs> years and never <laughs> took it out, like not one ride. And I was like, geez, you got it. Like, I, I'm sure I use my, I hate golf. I, I'm pretty sure I use my golf clubs more than once every four years. Yeah, yeah, like you yeah. got to hate it to leave it in the bike bag that long. Oh, I, I heard the same story. For example, Steph Clement, he, he had to retire because of back problems, but the team gave his, him a bike or like left him his bike, but he never used it 
for the next two years. And I was, oh, oh man, how many years before you retired, you already hated that thing so much, but you just did it for the money or the fame or just to be uh, for the wrong reasons, you know? So I'm happy that I still have it, but I'm all, also happy for those guys because, for example, Steph, he bought a gravel bike now and he's enjoying cycling on another level, you know, in the forest and on a gravel bike. So you don't have to go 30K an hour average anymore, at least, because that's on the road to standard... <laughs> In Holland, you have to do 30k an hour, otherwise the ride doesn't count, you know. And in gravel, you can you can blame the forest or you can blame your friend. <laughs> so yeah, and let's talk about. But I'm happy. a lot for cycling. Same for Carsten Kroon. He was also for two, three years not on the bike, and now in two weeks I go for a bike pack trip together with him and tanking. Also, Bram tanking. So the three retired guys are are going bike, and that's what I like. And also see Christian is back on the bike, so. Uh, yeah, I think it's awesome because for a long time, and I know I, I felt for this as well, I, I at a point where I thought, you know, I'm not going to progress in cycling. I'm not going to make the step up to pro continental level. I thought I need to quit cycling. And then I was actually, Mike Barry, it was riding for Team Sky, was coaching me at the time and I was yeah. living in Toronto. And I remember talking to Mike and Mike's like, it was like probably a week after I said I was quitting cycling. He texts me like, you coming for a bike ride? And I was like, I quit. And he's like, yeah, you quit trying to be pro. You're still going to go come ride your bike and go to a coffee shop. Like, I was like, (laughs) oh, yeah. And it just, the pendulum just dropped on me. I was like, fuck, they're not the same thing. I can still ride my bike with my friends and have fun. And that's why I started. I didn't start to try and make a career or try and make money. I started to have fun. And I suppose that circles back to the second part of your career. And now what you're doing looks way more fun than what you've done at the start. You've moved into gravel. Yeah, like I said, I wouldn't have missed. Uh, I wouldn't want to miss the the 16 years in the World Tour. But I'm also still. I'm also really happy that I'm in Gravel right now. And uh, unfortunately, 2020 was a difficult year. But uh, then we try in 2021. 2021. I'm not getting any younger, but I'm still uh, sure that I'm going to have a lot of fun in those races. You know and. I can't wait to travel the US in May from the Belgian Waffle Ride to do the Grasshoppers, to go to Kansas, all with a camper car, camper van, together with a bunch of friends who also like to ride bikes and talk shit to each other afterwards, you know. And uh, So how did all this come about? Huh? How did this all come about? How did the transition into gravel happen? Okay, we have to go back to that shit year I had in 2015, where I was basically the same as you, maybe, like... I'm 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 fed up with it, you know. Basically, I called my manager Joao. I said, "Okay, I'm done with the uh, racing in. Uh, <laughs> I'm done with racing in the World Tour, the thing you ab- admire to or you wanted to go to, <laughs> and I want to go to the U.S. Continental level. I want to race. In the <laughs> I would have traded okay. with you. <laughs> yeah. So, and he was like, "What do you say to me?" I said, "Yeah, I'm I'm done." And uh, because when I was 20 years old, I always had to get. I, I was together with my, uh, uh, my my current wife was back then my girlfriend already, and I said to her, "When I make it to a pro, maybe I do it for 10 years because that's what you do but back then when you become pro." It was, and then I'm 33, 34 years old, and the kids are still not be able to. Or they don't have to go to school. We can travel the world for one or two years. You know, I make enough money, and we save money. Like we say, 50,000, we can travel the world for two years and then uh, we go back to work and stuff like that. And then I become better and better in cycling and uh, I become, I do the Olympics, I do the Worlds, I become ninth in the Tour. So I got better contracts, you know, like a lot of money. And we say it's the golden uh, handcuffs or like, yeah. My, yeah. So, and then I, I did this. So I, then I got ninth in the Tour. I tried to be better. I tried to be skinnier. I break my back. I break my uh, ribs. Uh, I'm nothing in the Tour de France. Like, I don't know. I don't know my place, but not what I wanted to. And I'm next to the swimming pool together with my wife and my, my youngest kid, who is one year old. You know, <laughs> I'm doing the, like trying to make him asleep. And I say to my wife, what if we go to the US next year already? She looks to me and she says, "What?" Because I, like I said, I was making. A, we were going in contract negotiations for the next year, and I said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm fed. Up. I'm done." She, she said, "If you're sure, are you sure?" She said, "I said yes. Okay, then we go to the US, and I, I still I wanted to race. Like 
I was thinking about back then it was called, I think it was already Rally or uh, maybe Jelly Belly, you know, just oh, for yeah, the, yeah, they were a good Conti team. Jersey, <laughs> just to have the cool jersey and race with Lachlan. <laughs> and uh, then my manager told me like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, Joao, it was Joao is also US manager. I said, I'm done with it. I want to go to the US and race bikes, you know, and do those crits and do a road trip with my, with my team and basically being Phil Gaiman pro on $10 a day, <laughs> you know? And he said, what if I can find you a team that you still race the Tour de France because it's still your dream race where you dreamed of as a kid, right? I said, yeah, that's still my dream race, but, you know, I don't want to do 100 because back then in uh, on the Champs-Élysées, I counted 100 days back, 90 days I was not at home, and the 10 days I was at home, at least five, I was grumpy. I was tired. I was... <laughs> That's hard. Yeah. So for my wife, it hasn't been a pleasant time either. And I said, I want to do the tour, but I want to be with my family too. I said, what if I can fi- find you a team? You just do Paris-Nice and Catalonia and Swiss and the tour. And in the US, you race California. I say, okay. If you find that team, I sign that team, but I don't think you're going to find that team. At the end, he found a team with Sunweb. Back then, it was Giant Alpacy. So I went to the US and uh, I, I, I started to train that winter to get to the to Paris Nice, right? But you have to be a little bit competitive. So uh, I want, uh, my plan was to raise the US crits. Yeah. I had to, like a jersey, like a black jersey without sponsorship. I thought, okay, maybe. Oh, uh, you're not allowed in as a world tour yeah. rider then. So I found out, uh, that's it. <laughs> I found out, or my manager found out, USA Cycling is not going to let you in one of those crits. Yeah, I, I remember like, that. Fuck, man. How do, I get, how do I get in shape then for Paris? Because all the guys, all the other guys are racing and I'm here in Santa Cruz. You know, I'm having a good time, but I also need some intensity. You know, I did the Giro, I did the Tuesday ride, I did the Saturday ride, <laughs> but I didn't do the I didn't do the Ruta del Sol and stuff. So then my manager said, "Yeah, there's something here in Santa Rosa. It's called a grasshopper. It's something like an unsanctioned gravel." I said, "What? What is gravel?" I basically said, "It's a cyclocross, but it's not on laps of 1k, but just one big lap of 50 miles." I said, "Okay." Yeah. Let's go. So the guy, my manager, is living in Mill Valley. He arranged me a bike. I go there with the whole family in the car. It was two and a half hour drive from Santa Cruz. We arrive at that race, and at the, Ted King was there. Leva Leipheimer was there. Jeff Kabush was there. It's like the grasshopper <laughs> scene, you know. Suddenly now it's on cycling news, but it's just like, you know. So I, I get my number. I'm, I'm on the start line and. I race that race and suddenly everybody starts to sprint and I'm like, what the fuck is happening? But I also sprint, you know, to, to <laughs> the front. and we have to climb a gate. We have to climb one of those gates and, and I climb and down and 50 miles of like full racing, like a final of a classics. You know, I remember I hung it flatted on the last hill, Willow Creek or something. And, that King wins the thing. I think Levi got third. Gabus got third. Uh, Levi got second. Gabus got third. I got fourth. We arrived there on top of that hill. There's like a pallet with or two coolers with thousand cans of beer. Big bags of chips. You know, those big US bags of yeah. chips. And, and we're starting to drink beer and eat chips and talk about <laughs> the race. And I'm like, what the fuck? You know, this we should do this in the world tour, you know, like on the Champs Elysees, drinking beers and eating chips together after the tour. Because at the end, we had we had fun racing our bikes. That was uh, there was no money on the line. There was no prestige. It's just we all wanted to win the fucking grasshopper, you know. <laughs> and that's where it started basically. And I did a few more of those. I did Latville. But they're the early stages like, of gravel. Like this is a movement now, and you were there at the yeah, early stages. Yeah, it was like five years ago. And I did Grinduro. There was the second year of Grinduro, which is now in Japan and UK and Scotland and everywhere is Grinduro. But I did the one in Quincy, so the original one. And yeah, then it evolved from there. I came back to, I found back to the love of like Actually, 2016, I signed the contract and I said to the team, it's going to be my last year. And I still did 17, 18 and 19 continued because I found back my real love for cycling again, you know. So 17, 18, I raced with Dumoulin, the Giro and the Tour. And 19, I was my last year at CCC. 
So basically, that grasshopper extended my career with three years. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> And so how did it come about then that you're making the transition now into like you've got a bunch of sponsors behind you, you're planning on yeah. like something I'd love to do, getting over doing all these US races. How does that happen? So yeah, that uh, so but, uh, I'm kind of I don't know, yeah, in Holland we say on the name entrepreneur. So I'm I'm I like to arrange things and to start new things. So I came back in Holland. Wheeler and dealer, we call it here. Uh, what? Wheeler and also, Wheeler and Dealer. Yeah, yeah. Wheeler and dealer. <laughs> So I started that podcast, but I also, I actually, I created uh, some, uh, I created something like Granduro, but in Europe. So we have uh, the same event, same, same format, uh, LTD Gravel Rate. It's in, uh, in Germany. And now in this year, we should have two events, but because of COVID, they didn't happen. But I have two, now two gravel events myself. Oh, fuck. I'm there oh. next year. It's on race yeah. of the podcasters. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's really cool always sold out you know we have so it's friday you come saturday is race day saturday night is a big party a real big party <laughs> and sunday we have a hangover right <laughs> uh how do you call this in, in in english a can of beers right so not a six pack but a car oh like a keg yeah like 24 yeah, no, yeah like yeah. 24 beers in one Oh yeah, I don't even know if that has a name that's just something like piss heads get when they're going on the yeah, session no. <laughs> so so we had the first uh, last year we had two uh five uh, si i think 600 people and it was it was 200 250 cages of 24 <laughs> bottles so everybody had like almost half a cage of bottles beer salt it's like a like a rock festival last year my kids were there my youngest I organized his first uh, rock festival. Oh, man, so. I need to get over and do your event because I'm running the first. So we've no gravel events in Ireland, but I'm running the first gravel event next year oh, in Ireland. Really? But oh, cool. I, I haven't mapped out the course and haven't really figured out the team for it yet because COVID has just been a wipeout. But I'll definitely have to pick your brain on that because that sounds amazing. Yeah. I, I love the hangover ride idea. Yeah, no, the hangover. No, so, so I have two events in gravel. And yeah, I have contacts with sponsors and stuff like that. Also, basically, also because of the events, and I knew I was going to be too old to do world tour, but I still wanted. You know what I really like about racing? I, that, that's something I'd really clear for myself. What I really liked in the racing was being with the boys. You know, in the bus, on the dinner table, yeah, talking shit. Watching girls, uh, talking races, uh, taking the piss with each other, drink a beer at the bar at night, stuff like that. Having a barbecue on the rest day. And, uh, and also a little bit the adrenaline of, of pinning a number and show your best, yeah. you know, on, on whatever level. So I tried to seek that also after the career because I didn't want to be one of those cyclists being at home, don't know what to do not riding your bike and divorce your wife within two years. It's just not good for I mean. your mental health. Like when I chat to some of the guys and they're just like stopped and they're piling on weight and they're drinking and I'm just like, yeah. go back to make what makes you happy. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I realized already when I, when I retired from the world tour, I want that. And I created that with having a small team around me, the guy I do the podcast with Stephen, uh, Dennis, the guy who does the clothing, because we're also doing something in gravel clothing. And uh, and we, we like I said, we go to the US or we, we hire one of those big RVs and we just travel there and having the same feeling as being on the bus. Maybe we take a mechanic when the budget is when the budget is enough, we can take a mechanic for the whole month and have fun with four or five guys, you know, and trying to race and have the best after uh, tailgate barbecue afterwards, you know, and, and make fr make new friends. So I uh, yeah, I pitched that plan with with my sponsors, with my partners, and they were yeah they were onto it. And I think I also learned from my manager who did the uh, who did something impossible. Me racing Euro racing a European team, being a Euro Euro European, living in the US was never happening before. And now I do also something what's never been done before but it's not against the law it's just against the rules but fuck the rules you know uh, it's brilliant i talked to pete Stetton on the podcast a while ago and he had the exact same like idea just going around talking to sponsors and pitching them this crazy idea going like i'm out of world tour but i don't want to let go of my fitness i still want to go and race hard yeah. like all over the us and he managed to pull together some people that believed in the same dream as him and it seems like you've done the same in europe 
Yeah, yeah. Now, basically, I also have some US uh, funding. But uh, yeah, the thing is also I have like a platform like you have to get with my podcast. I'm also still I'm also editor of bicycling, the Dutch version, like uh, ah, cool. I, I, I write for Pro Cycling UK. So yeah, I'm, 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 I think you call it editor in chief. And uh, that's the that's the <laughs> official word in uh, in English. That's so, awesome. Yeah. So I have a, I have a yeah in Holland and yeah I have a big platform and I can use it to to pull some strings and my my goal is to to bring the people the love for cycling and the love for the bike and they love where the bike can bring them and to bring them on new adventures you know like. And and that's what my goal is for the people. And I don't care if you if you ride a, a, a two hundred dollar Markplatz bike or like a twelve thousand dollar S Works. As long as you have fun, that's okay for me, you know. And like I love I the road bike, and I still I still race on the road uh, over yeah. in Ireland, amateur. And like I'm me still too, racing. Eh? You still race? Yeah, I still do the local club races on the yeah, road. Yeah, I still race in Cat One stuff, and it's so much fun. Like, yeah. And but. You know what? The more what I used to love about it was it was so elitist and exclusionary. But the more, the older I get, and I see friends who are scared to get into the sport, I just feel like gravel is that inclusive part of cycling yeah. that we've always been missing. Because there's so many goofy customs that you know you and I just think are normal. Your socks need to be the right length. Your <laughs> shoes need to be matching your helmet. Your stem has to be slammed. Like you've all these weird customs, and you look at someone yeah. and go. Look at his stem. Look at his handlebar angle. What a dickhead. Gravel yeah, is just I, like, I, I, wear whatever I, I, you want. Yeah, I, I also never fitted that plate, actually, because I was the guy who barbecued, you know, and drunk, drink beer and stuff like that. Also, that I, I really like Pete. We, I gave him shit a lot of times, you know, because uh, he's like the careful pro and I play yeah, the, I know, yeah. <laughs> the slow card, you know. like <laughs> Ted King gives him shit for using the aero bars. Yeah, yeah, I give Ted also a lot of shit, but uh, actually we're friends already since 2016, you know, when I when I lived in the US. But what I, because they, they are a little bit a younger generation in the world tour than I was. And what I don't like is they, they are the advocates of like in the world tour, you only had to do efforts and not drink beer, not drink wine. And I'm like, maybe I did two real interval training a year. Like, but those were like real interval training. Like, I don't know how you call it. You're a coach, but I would go ice boss full and then another one full. And I did three sets and I would crawl home. And those were the training I was nervous of. But the rest I did was what they, they call like soul rides. I did it all the time. Like 99% of my riding was soul rides. And still, and also when I got ninth in that Tour de France, every, nine, every night I drink one glass of wine like during the race like yeah. also the in the vuelta also at home for me there was not a, and the, for me it was not an issue of i never did three glasses of wine like maximum two when i <laughs> when i allowed myself <laughs> another one but like it did uh, like the world to wasn't are, is not as strict as they sometimes picture it that's what i want to say you know like for me i it think was the guys like break. pete stetner they're one generation after it seems like you've almost like, you know, we call it in religion before Christ and after. It's yeah. almost like before Team Sky and after. Because yeah. after Team Sky, anyone that came along, it seems like they made, no matter what level they were at, even if they only got to, you know, Pro Conti, it seems like they made sacrifices that were just crazy, like no alcohol, no desserts ever, no exceptions. Yeah. But like the guys, that, exactly. The guys before that just have a little bit of a looser attitude and like, you know what, I try and hurt. But as you say, I'll live slow. Yeah, the thing is, you have to. Uh, that's with everything in life. But if you want to, if you if you become pro, you have to look at it as a long term project. It has to be sustainable. So if you start to do everything right, like I tried to do in 2015, I I realized in uh, September after 10 months, oh no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> It's not going to be like that. I'm not, and I switched like maybe totally the other side because I moved the I moved the uh, the other side of the ocean. But you have to like Nicky Tabster. I train a lot with him because I live close to him, and he says when you become a pro, you have to make sure you find a way that you can that you can do it at least for ten or twelve or fifteen years, and not for like 
a few months, uh, just a few months, you know? So that's, uh, that's the thing. Yeah. Cause I see it. I actually have a new client and I was talking to him the other day and I was saying to him, it's, it's almost sounds counterintuitive as a phenomenon. I was saying your enthusiasm is unsustainable. Like you can't have how excited you are about training. Yeah, it's not going to exactly. last you six months, four years, five years, 10 years. This is a six week project. If you don't curb your shit down, like yeah. you can't have Excellent. this level of enthusiasm. Like the dude's 15 minutes early for every training session. Like he's texting yeah. me like I'm here. I'm like, well, I haven't left yet. I'll be there at the fucking time. I said I'd be there. Are you trying to get with him? I'm uh, trying to get with him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Like my, the host of my podcast is the same. He started training now. And in the beginning, it's always, like, oh, they think they become better instantly, like in two weeks. And, it, I say, is it because the training you do or is it because you're just more focused on doing the right things? You know, like uh, maybe you train more and stuff like that. And in the beginning, it always seems also not too much. I think you also do progression. I said, wait till week four. There's like a four hour ride on the schedule. <laughs> it's a little bit raining. And then you also still need to find the motivation to go out and, and still do it, you know? So it has to be sustainable. And I think that's, uh, that's the thing. Uh, young pros, they don't need to forget. And if you, if you put yourself on a Til Paris Robert from the 1st of November, I don't drink alcohol, any alcohol diet. You don't, it, it's not because you don't do it. You deserve the, those results because everybody is doing their best. And maybe the guy drinks a beer, but he's still training 15 minutes longer or whatever, you know, like everybody is at the best at Roubaix. It's not because you didn't drink anything or you deserve that result. That's not the case. And that's what I talk a lot with my younger, uh, with my younger colleagues the last, the last few years. You pulled off something pretty cool this year. Uh, I want to finish up on this one. Uh, so dirty cans, uh, it's in gravel. It's, I don't know, it's the Paris-Roubaix, it's the World Championships, it's the big one, whatever the, the corollary is in road. Cancelled this year, obviously, and you came up with a nice play on words and called it Dirty Cancelled. And yeah. you guys went and done your own thing. Tell us what that was yeah. all about. Yeah, that was something. I was uh, I was in Girona at the beginning of March, so actually when things started to collapse in, in Europe, I was at a specialized uh, lounge from, uh, from a new bike for journalists. But I was also there on the terrace with a with an old friend. I did a ride with him in December. Jack Ultra Cyclist, some Aussie guy who was crazy. Actually, would be a nice guy, guest. You had him on the podcast already or not? No, no, I haven't had him now. Oh, I, don't, I don't know him. A few weeks ago, he did the world record most kilometers in one week. Uh, these guys are he crazy. Did, I don't know how they uh, do it. Those, he did the Taiwan Com. I did it. The year he, I was there, he did it four times in a row. I was like, fuck, that was the hardest climb of my life. I didn't want to do it any <laughs> minute more. He did it I gotta check him out after the show. So we were thinking about he was going. Uh, he, he was also going to do Kansas, but of course the XL edition, like the 350 miles edition. But we were on the terrace and we were like drinking uh, beers, uh, Spanish beers, and we were like, okay, fuck. When dirty cancer is not happening this year, we're going to find something else, and we call it dirty cancelled. And that <laughs> idea sticked, you know. <laughs> And then all good plans part. are drunken plans, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And actually, I, like I, I told you about my platform and with the podcast and with bicycling and the website, we tried to, and with Instagram, and we made some kind of a promo website and it took off. It got viral. It went viral. It was, I think, every continent except of Antarctica, people were riding the bikes at the same time for 200 miles at 6 a.m. start, max two rest stops. Uh, self-supported we had the same rules as in dirty kenza you had like wild van art and stuff down as well didn't you yeah wild van art was doing <laughs> it <laughs> actually our plan was to make the, the our dream plan would have been that wild van art and Matja van der poel would do it together you know because <laughs> they are enemies already <laughs> like the bike would bring them together and they could hammer themselves for 200 miles you know but that didn't happen and everybody could take out what they did because uh, Stefan did it with another friend and they just enjoyed themselves for 200 miles. And of course, they were also really tired. I really needed that adrenaline and Nikki Turpstra too. So we 
basically we hammered each other for 200 miles like we attacked each other and tried to be the best and also <laughs> the weeks before we were thinking about our gear our training nutrition like for a 200 mile ride and when you want to go fast everything has to be dialed you know so especially when you're going with nikki terrestre yeah yeah and also everybody had to design their own route from their house or like yeah, the house of your friend maximum two people was allowed to, or three people was allowed to write and allowed to write in holland like the together back then and uh yeah everybody made a route on Komoot because that's the best routing thing to find all the gravel in holland and i think we had 2000 people doing it like riding 300 kilometers on the same day it was that's amazing. i was so proud we made a movie out of it so you can watch it on youtube Oh, I'm going to check it out and I'll link it up in the description yeah. for this for anyone that's listening. Lawrence, I want to finish up on one last question that I ask all the podcast guests. So if you want one piece of advice, one tip, one training session, one anything that somebody's given you or you've learned through your career that's impacted your cycling career the most, what would that be? Okay, this is, this is kind of easy. This is an, I, I told this story more often. In 2006, so I, I became a pro in 2004. In 2006, I was riding for a new team, and I got uh, befriended with a with a Belgium guy, an older Belgium guy, and his name was Erwin Thijs. And I trained with him every day, you know, and he learned me how to train as a pro because I remember I was there, like, training with him. What are we going to do tomorrow? Five hours. Okay, five hours. What are we going to do tomorrow? Tomorrow. Training. How long? Yeah. Five hours. Okay, so three days, five <laughs> hours. What are we going to do tomorrow? Easy. Okay, how long? Two hours. Okay, so it was like three days on, one day off, and that's the whole winter too, basically. And then in spring, I, be, I did a race. It was somewhere in uh, Catalonia, I think, or Castilla Leon or something like that. And I became 18th on a mountain, but it was the, the years of US Postal. I think Acevedo won the race. So I was, climbing, I was climbing together with Fino Kurov and those guys. Yeah. And he told me because I was, before I was known as a time trialist, he said, Lawrence, he said, I think if you lose a little bit of weight and you try to focus more on climbing, you become a, you, you become a, yeah, it's better for you because. There are not so many climbers in the in, in Belgium and Holland, so you you stick you stick out more, you know. Like uh, you will make a lot more money, you will be more uh, uh, like a star or what's a, uh, yeah more yeah. popular. And uh, and that's what he said to me. So I tried to focus on climbing since then more, and then from there it started to go up. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's a great story, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Lawrence. Thank you for your time. I could chat to you all night about cycling. Uh, if anyone wants to keep following on your journey after the podcast, as I'm sure they will, what's the best places to keep up with you? I know you're all over the place. Yeah, so basically, the best is to watch it, um, to 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 stay tuned with the website liveslowridefast.com, and all the podcasts are on there, and the, the clothing, the the events, everything is there. So. Stay, uh, stay tuned on liftslowridefast.com. My Instagram too, basically. That's my daily life. You see me, you see me cooking or doing some bikepacking. Yeah, I seen you had a bit of chicken for dinner there. there off. <laughs> 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 Lawrence, thanks for chatting. Yeah. Talk soon. Okay, see ya. Bye-bye.